It's the mid-1970s and Volvo is heavily in debt. The new 200 series is unreliable, they have 43,000 gas guzzling large family cars waiting to be sold at a time when the world is swarming to small fuel economical cars. Volvo's trying every trick in the book to stay afloat and at the same time must spend money to develop a new car to sell in the 1980s, if it makes it to the 1980s. But the investment paid off. The 700 series would be the car that saved Volvo and would go on to sell almost 2 million cars. This is the Volvo 740 and 760 story. Just a year after the 200 series launch, Volvo started to look towards its replacement. The new car should capitalise on the 200's best points while moving the car brand upmarket to a more profitable category. Project NV80 as it was called focused on seven key criteria to make the new car a success. The 200 series had been unreliable out of the gate, although that quickly improved, but Volvo would make reliability a big focus of the new car. The 1973 oil crisis also loomed large. Customers were moving towards small fuel efficient cars and Volvo, a maker of large family cars, was suffering financially. The new car would use fuel injection and turbo diesels to make the cars competitive. Volvo wanted the new car to have a lower total cost of ownership, from purchase to trade-in. If they couldn't win the battle for the cheapest car in its class, they wanted to show it was cheaper to service. Those serviceable parts will be easily accessible, so even an inexperienced owner could change them and garage repair bills will be lower. If nothing else, it would reduce the cost for Volvo's own service centres. For example, to replace a headlamp bulb, it's simply a matter of twisting the holder out, swapping the bulb and replacing it. On some cars, it could be a much more complex process, for example on the VW Beetle developed over 20 years later. By 1976, many different designs had been created, some from Volvo design lead Jan Vilsgaard, who had penned Volvo's cars since the Amazon in 1956, but others from outside design firms Coggiola and Ital Design. The finance department wanted a simple shape that was cheap to manufacture, and this made the team look at a simple straight edge design. But that boxy shape needed a drag coefficient of just 0.4 to help make this a low cost fuel efficient car to own. After a great deal of work in a British wind tunnel, they would achieve just that. After much deliberation, the team chose Jan Vilsgaard's design. Three shapes were considered, a saloon, a hatchback and an estate, but making all three was simply too expensive. So the plan was to focus on the top of the range saloon first and introduce an estate later on. With finances tight, the new car would inherit the already good underpinnings and rear wheel drive layout from the Volvo 200 series. To improve handling and interior comfort, the wheelbase would be extended 5 inches while keeping the overall length the same. Transmission and engines would also be carried over, using the same V6 developed with Renault and Peugeot, introduced in 1974 and used by the DeLorean. The suspension would be tuned for predictable handling to ensure it would be a safe car to drive. The rear axle would be suspended by a subframe to reduce road noise, making it a quieter, higher end driving experience. With the NV80 project now renamed to Project P31, the design team toured Volvo's export markets, getting market data to lock down the car's design. What would 1980s drivers be looking for and what upcoming legislation could hinder it? This helped shape the car and ensure it would have a long life. But Volvo's finances were getting worse. By 1976, thousands of cars were left unsold because of overestimating demand. Volvo's loan request from the Swedish government was rejected, forcing them to think of drastic measures to survive. Management looked into merging with Saab the following year, but these plans were ultimately dropped. The P31 project was ominously renamed to Project 1155, that's 5 minutes to 12, meaning there wasn't much time left to get the car out before Volvo went bankrupt. This was the car that would make or break Volvo. To make sure the car was right, Volvo held public product clinics in Volvo's top export markets, West Germany and the USA. The car was unbranded so participants didn't know it was a Volvo, but given its boxy shape, what else could it have been? 
Customer response was overwhelmingly positive, calling it a luxurious, safety-conscious car, just what Volvo was going for. There were of course criticisms, but these were minor. For example, the windscreen rate was too severe, and the feedback was taken on board to improve the car. The car had initially been planned for a 1980 introduction, but it took until spring of 1978 to get a drivable prototype, and the car's introduction would be delayed until 1982. With tight finances, Volvo came up with a slightly odd plan to prevent bankruptcy. The Norwegian government would give Volvo rights to drill for oil in newly found North Sea oil seams, and Volvo would then sell the oil. This would make Volvo the only car company that was also an oil company. But Volvo shareholders nixed the deal in 1979 and had their knives out to cut Project 1155 entirely to save money. Without a 200 series successor, Volvo would be in even more trouble, so Project 1155 continued apace, now renamed to Project 01. With the USA being an important market, the car had to be tested not just for extreme cold, but extreme heat, so the car was taken to the Australian outback and Rocky Mountains. To further gauge customer opinion for the car, and to show Volvo's progress in fuel-efficient vehicles, the VCC, or Volvo Concept Car, was shown in 1980. It was essentially an estate version of Project Zero One, and became just one of many VCC badge concepts Volvo would produce over the years. Production of Volvo's two-door coupe, the 262C, ended in 1981. High-end two-door coupe sold well in the USA, if Volvo could get the package right, so they looked to make a replacement design on Project Zero One's chassis. They turned to old collaborators Bertoni to bring it to production. The new coupe, dubbed Project 1780, started in August 1981. Volvo suggested Bertoni take a Project Zero One chassis and make minor modifications, but Bertoni thought more major work was needed to make a compelling car. Volvo didn't agree with Bertoni's design, so sent Jan Vilsgaard to Italy to help out. Together they produced a compelling package, but with the resulting design not sharing a single panel with Project Zero One, the profit margin was going to be slim. By this time, Project Zero One development had cost around 600 million US dollars. Although the 200 series continued to sell well, Volvo had a lot riding on this car. They were already developing a compact executive car, but if Project Zero One, now dubbed the Volvo 760, wasn't successful, there wouldn't be any money to bring it to reality. To protect Volvo's truck, bus, and construction equipment businesses from bankruptcy, the car division was spun off into a separate company. The Volvo 760 launched on February 2nd, 1982 as a high-spec luxury four-door saloon. With power steering, electric windows, sunroof and mirrors, heated seats, alloy wheels, central locking, leather seats, and an automatic gearbox, it checked the boxes as a safe, luxurious car. It came in cheaper than the German and US competition, a niche Volvo would come to own into the 21st century. But European reviewers were less sure. They felt the boxy shape was out of step with current European car fashions, and that it wouldn't sell. The boxy shape was too American, but it also looked like it would protect its occupants, which played to Volvo's strengths. Those Bohemians who had loved their 240 were growing up and wanted something more luxurious, and the 760 fit the bill. The 760 was intended to replace the 260, but for now both models were sold alongside each other, with the 260 being the more cost-effective model, and I think that's marketing speak for cheap. Volvo had used this tactic before, and it helped get much needed additional profit from a car that had already paid off its development and tooling costs. By 1983, the 760 was also being powered by an economical turbo diesel. But Volvo also took the 2.1 litre petrol turbo engine from the 240 and expanded it to 2.3 litres, giving the car a blistering 0-60 time of under 8 seconds. That's like sticking a Mentos mint into a Diet Coke, if the Coke weighed nearly 2 metric tons and was rather boxy. 
Volvo themselves used a marketing campaign to compare the car to the Porsche 944. Both cars had identical quarter mile times, but to cap it all, the Volvo got to 60 miles an hour first. The range was filled out in 1984 with the introduction of the more cost-effective 740, providing more reasons for customers to choose it over the 240. Back in the 200 series days, the 6 in 260 stood for 6-cylinder engines with the 4 for 4-cylinder, but Volvo had long abandoned this nomenclature, using the 4 for lower spec cars that often had smaller engines to cut costs. The stalwart Volvo red block engine used in the 240 and indeed in the new 760 would be updated to provide better performance and fuel efficiency. But the 740 wasn't merely a stripped down basic model. The base model came with power steering, central locking and indeed heated seats as standard. No wonder then that the 740 was much more popular than the 760. The 700 range was further expanded the following year with the 740 and 760 estate. It was based on the 1980 VCC, but extended to provide more cargo space. And to improve the 700 series, ABS and traction control were added, and the 740 gained a turbo. Volvo would announce their new car in the time-honoured ancient Swedish tradition of stacking things on top of it. They would stack a large truck, and also several other Volvos that they'd done with the 140 when that was launched. With this, the 700 series would now replace the 200 series, but the 240 continued to sell and sell and sell and sell and sell. To complete the range, that two-door coupe from Bertoni was introduced in Geneva in 1986 as the 780. It was a highly appointed car that was used to take Volvo further up market. Volvo had tested the car, but Bertoni would manufacture it. The sumptuous interior would be customised just for this car, and included all the creature comforts from the 760, plus wood trim, electrically adjustable seats, and cruise control. The team did want to add a turbo, but the small engine bay caused overheating, but a turbo diesel option was available. In 1988, the 760 got a subtle update. The wipers were hidden to make them more aerodynamic, and the front was revised, making it more sloped. Both the 760 and 780 got multi-link suspension to provide better handling, and Volvo was one of the first companies to add this to a mass-produced car. The following year, the four-cylinder, two-litre petrol engines gained 16 valves, a turbo and an intercooler to provide further fuel economy and performance, giving up to 200 horsepower. Volvo evaluated a 2.3-litre version, but discounted it as it would be too powerful for the existing gearbox. But the 700 series updates were subtle, as Volvo was focusing a lot of its time on developing the new 850 that would be introduced in 1991, and in fact many of the 700 series improvements at that time came from 850 development. The 740's front styling was updated in 1990, the car got a dashboard update in 1991, and the 780 coupe was discontinued. But this wasn't the beginning of the end. Back in 1988, Volvo had started looking at the 740 and 760's replacement, but with all funds going into 850 development, there was little money left. Given its strong sales and the continued sales of the 200 series, which refused to die, Volvo believed that they could get additional life out of the 740 and 760 with a styling update, particularly around the back of the saloon that was looking dated. Operation Backlift, as it would be known, also looked at the old 1974 V6 engine that was becoming uncompetitive. The 850 would use a new X100 four-cylinder engine. Volvo were able to enlarge it to both a five-cylinder and six-cylinder version, and the six-cylinder would be used on the updated 760. The subtle styling update was influenced by the 850's new look, and the similarity would give the cars a family feel. But the changes around the front were subtle with the 740 and 760 update being called the 940 and 960, if you didn't know where to look, mainly around the back of the saloon, the only thing that would tip you off it was the new car was the 9 on the badge. Around 1991, the Volvo lineup was confusing. There was the 200 series about to end its life in 1993, then there was the last of the 700 series being sold at the same time as the 900 series it was replacing, 
Then there was the slightly shorter but very similar 850. Am I the only casual observer that got baffled by Volvo's lineup at this time? But by 1993, the lineup was rationalized to just the 850, 940, and 960. Volvo's decision to soldier on with essentially the same car was a smart move, as the car still sold well and was updated just a year later, further updating the styling both inside and out to keep it relevant with the times and taking technology updates along the way. By now the car was being built all around the world, a testament to just how popular it was in multiple export markets and to how good the original 700 series design was. In 1996, Volvo rebadged its range with S for Saloon and V for Estate, and this meant the 900 series was renamed the S90 and V90 in select markets. But age was finally catching up with the venerable car, and production ended in 1998. The car had to sell well to save Volvo, and sell well it did, selling over 1.9 million cars in its 16-year production run, despite having to compete against its cheaper predecessor for much of its life. The 700 series set the mould for the large saloon and estate the company would be known for well into the 21st century. Matchbox cars have a long and storied history. Find out more by clicking on the video on the right. And a big thank you to all my patrons for supporting me. To get early advert free access to new videos or to appear in the credits, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.